So we were talking about reading market structure. And what we're going to talk about today is how we add different styles of information gathering, which is what we're talking about, right? Order flow, volume spread analysis, momentum, exhaustion, divergence. That's all gathering information to help us better understand what's happening in the market now so we can anticipate what's likely to happen next. That is trading, folks. That's it. That's the crux of it. We're gathering information, okay, to help us make better and informed decisions. Okay, so we're going to talk about today uh, what market structure is, um, how market structure is different from chart patterns, okay? So a lot of people have a, a misunderstanding that uh, chart patterns is all about the structure of the market, and it's actually two different things, okay? So don't be confused by the fact that you, you're, if you're trying to trade chart patterns and you think you're trading market structure, it's, it's totally different. Um, we're going to talk about how to utilize market structure, the optimal time frame, the best indicators that you can use for a confluence of those uh, that information that I showed you on the last slide. We're looking for a confluence of all of those things so that we can have as much information as possible to understand what is likely to happen next. And then we're going to talk about each of the indicators that, uh, that help us to make good decisions, to make high probability decisions. And we're not, we're not looking for one indicator to do everything for us, okay? Just like in the real world, we often have lots of indicators that we want to use to help us make a, a good decision. So, for example, and I've, I've used this example in the past, you happen to know that it's 60 degrees outside, well, and you're trying to decide, do I want to take a coat with me or not? Well, there's more to making that decision than is it 60 degrees. You know, is it windy? Is it raining? Is it cloudy? Is it bright and sunny? Is it, you know, there's a lot of other information you can gather to help make a better decision. And, and then you finally make that decision and you're more likely to be right than, than if you just use one piece of information. All right, so that's what we're doing with our trades and our trade setups is we're using a confluence of information, all right? So we talk about market structure, and there's they're very different. Market structure is the underlying framework that defines the organization and dynamics of a market, okay? Not what's going on in this one at particular minute or second or f time frame. It's the organization and dynamics of the entire market, okay? The framework is what you build on, all right? Chart patterns are different. Chart patterns are just something that kind of materialize, uh, and then people have noticed these patterns, and they uh, um, they start to believe that because they see this pattern and something that's happened after that, that that's likely to happen again. Um, if you look at enough charts, you'll begin to see patterns that occur more than once. In fact, it's it's kind of a human tendency to see patterns. Um, and, and that's, you know, that's how we recognize faces and stuff. Um, but it's a tendency to see patterns where none exist. And, and humans do that. It's, it's known as Pare de, de <laughs> I know I can't say this right. Pare de Lia. Pare de Lia, okay? That's what's uh, uh, known as, as finding patterns in things where they don't necessarily exist or they exist and they don't have any necessary meaning. So it can lead to misguided trading decisions. The theory is if this pattern happened and then something else happened after it, then that's what's going to happen every time, okay? So that's the whole idea behind trying to make use of 
chart patterns in your trading. Now, I don't know about you. I tried it for many years. I spent a lot of time and energy, not to mention money, wasted on studying chart patterns. And, and, and you know, the, then I got to look back on why did I do that? Because we want them to work. Because that would make trading easy, right? It fits right into what we know and understand about everyday life. You know, cause and effect. If this happens, then this, okay? So, so or, or we could be, you know, if this happens, then I need to protect myself from this. You know, in physics, we have for every action, there's a equal and opposite reaction. And, you know, use health as an example of, you know, a poor sleep pattern can cause fatigue. You know, there are patterns of things that if you see something, then you're likely to believe that something's going to happen. And this is based on experience. Okay. So that's the law of cause and effects. And it says that all successes and failures necessarily have a reason and a result. So this is why we're so interested in chart patterns. But they're really just simply random patterns that we try to make sense out of because they it, it would make things easier. But I'm going to tell you, and this is my opinion, and I know that there's some of you sitting here uh, in this event or watching this on video going, nope, he's wrong. That absolutely works. I've been working them for many years, and it works every time. Okay, so that has not been my experience, nor anybody I have ever met that says that trading chart patterns works for them, okay? They work great in hindsight. For any of you who have, have tried them, they work great in hindsight. Market structure is something totally different. Now, and I'm going to go through this quickly because uh, we did this on Thursday. Um, even if you saw Thursday's event, okay, a lot of this bears repeating just to make sure you get it. Repetition is really how we learn things. You know, hearing something once is not how we learn. You know, we might go, oh, that's interesting. Repetition's how, how to make it stick. So we're going to do some repetition here. Market structure can take different forms, uh, including trending markets characterized by higher highs and higher lows and and different time frames. OK, so in the long term trading, we might even want to classify this as investing. OK, so you can see that, you know, price over the long term, it starts low, goes high, drops down. And, you know, you might be interested in that in the, uh, you know, as an investor, but as somebody who's trying to trade the markets, uh, you know, uh, dynamically rather than just putting money in and waiting, um, you're uh, you're you're not too interested in this type of market structure. These longer-term traders are more into fundamental analysis, not technical analysis. Um, you know, like cash flow or or capital management or you know the fundamentals of the of the business you know, looking at all the financials. So this long-term structure is, is not going to have the relevance to those of us that are, that are day traders. Okay. Then we have, you know, like a medium term where you are picking up highs and lows, but again, this is more, uh, uh, more of an interest to like swing traders. You're not going to see the same exact type of structure or be able to make good decisions based on this type of structure over a longer period of time, anything over being a day trader. Um, you might find it somewhat helpful, but it's not the type of thing that you can build your, uh, your trades around. Now, we come to the short term. This is where day traders ultimately get involved in market structure and using it to make very quick and uh, very high probability decisions, okay? 
Um, it's day traders are intimately involved in each and every price movement that creates the underlying structure of the long and medium term that I just showed you. So we want to see where the big boys are playing, right? What markets are they interested in manipulating for their own gain and when they do it and all of this, okay? So you get a much more granular detail on the short term for day traders, okay? Um, so I, I mentioned the, the, the smart money, the big boys, right? So this is exactly what we need so that we can figure out what these guys are doing. The market structure is made by these big boys, okay, the smart money. And um, if we know what those guys are doing, then we know what's likely to happen next, right? And that's really all there is to day trading. That's, that's what we're all looking for, right? is what's likely to happen next. So here's what I can show you with, with adding price action to market structure, okay? Have, and, and by analyzing market structure, we gain insights into the underlying sentiment, um, the potential turning points of areas of interest for entering and exiting trades. This this empowers us to develop a systematic approach that enhances our decision making. Okay. So market structure analysis helps us traders to develop an, an edge in the markets by recognizing significant market levels and understanding the dynamics between buyers and sellers. Okay. You can identify very high probability trade setups, or at least areas where those high probability setups are likely. Now, no, no strategy can guarantee success, uh, you know, in every trade or in all trades. Okay. So, uh, I mean, in, in most trades, but understanding market structure significantly enhances the, pro the, the probability of profitable trades, okay? So we're looking at the buyer and seller dynamics when we have, uh-oh, everybody can still hear me, right? I guess Rich is not able to hear me. Okay. Uh, somebody type in there that he maybe log out and log back in with a different browser or something, please. All right, so we're going to look at the characteristics of market structure, okay? This is why market structure is so different than uh, chart patterns, okay? A lot of us get confused between the two. So there are phases there are four phases. The first phase of market structure is accumulation. Okay? So what are the characteristics? It's slow and stealthy. Okay? So the big boys, remember, we're talking about the big boys, the market makers. They're coming in and they're buying up all the available assets. assets. But if they do it in a hurry, what happens? Everybody knows, right? Everybody knows what's going on. So they typically take, it, it takes place in areas of congestion. So what are you and I doing when we see these areas of congestion? Nothing. We're sitting there because price is just chopping around, kind of going sideways. It's relatively low volume. We're starting to fall asleep and peruse YouTube and Facebook and whatever. Price is just trading in a range, right? So this is what accumulation might look like on a uh, on a typical chart. Now, just just so you know, I said this on Thursday. This can be, we can go and look at any chart, and you're going to see patterns like this. You're going to see this exact thing, but variations of it. Okay, 
this is a uh, um, a, a, this is a very simplified version, so it's easy for me to show and teach. That being said, you can also find this exact chart set up, this pattern of the structure, um, just by looking at at any chart that ha that's uh, of a of a liquid instrument. Okay. So this can be a somewhat of an oversimplification, and over time you'll see it in, in other patterns that aren't as clear as this, okay? So we've got these areas of congestion. Price is going sideways. We're just kind of getting bored. And then phase two starts to happen. We have the markup phase, okay? So that's where we get a series of higher highs and higher lows. Price starts raising, but again, it's not necessarily on high volume. Okay, we always think of price pushing real hard and fast that we've suddenly the volume came flying in, but it's not necessarily on high volume because the big boys don't want it to be high volume that because they know all of us retail traders, us little guys, what do we watch? What do we all have on our charts? Volume. Because we think volume matters. Just having, just knowing volume, we think it matters. Now, it might, but it also can, can kind of trick you into believing something that isn't necessarily true. So just watching quantity volume in and of itself might be somewhat helpful, but we're going to talk about uh, a particular type of volume here in a minute. So we get this markup phase where they, the big boys now have kind of cornered the market on all of the available assets. Now they control the market. They can pretty much do whatever they want. All right. So remember, I said that's low volume. So they don't want to tip their hands on what they're doing. But what we're looking at now is the momentum traders, and I'm going to talk about that in a few minutes too. They're going to push it up, and then they're going to test that next level, and they're going to see if price holds. And if it holds, they're likely to do it again. They're going to mark it up a little bit more, okay? Okay. Now, they're not making any profits yet. They're controlling the market. They're controlling the rate at which price is increasing so that they can get to the next phase. Next phase is distribution. Again, we don't know when it's happening necessarily. We're bored out of our gourds, right? We're sitting here wondering when we get to take a trade. Smart money moves just as slowly as accumulation, but what they start doing is they start selling off a large portion of their assets. All right, and then it finishes with these up thrust bars where it jumps out of the area of distribution. All right. Distribution is where they make their money, okay? I know we all have been, we all believe that they make their money on these big sudden up thrusts, okay? This is not, this is where they're manipulating the market. This is not where they're making their money. They're buying low, they're testing it, and if it holds, they'll buy some more. They're testing it, and then they're going to come up here, and they're going to start. If it holds, they're going to start selling. And they're going to do it slowly over time. Again, so us little retail traders don't really know what's going on. And then they've made their profit, yet they're smart enough not to distribute everything here and then end up with no assets uh, or no holdings of this asset because now they can't control anything and they can't control what happens next. 
So what they do is they're going to still maintain a large portion. They've already made their profits. Now, they're going to, again, drive price up as far as it'll go. And that's what these up thrust bars are doing. Okay? And then the next phase, they want to set this whole thing up again so they can do it again. But they got to get price back down where it's cheap, right? So price starts, or supply goes rushing in because they just dump everything on the market. Prices drop faster than many people can offload what they've got, okay? So they just dump everything they've got on the market. Well, when price overwhelms demand, because the demand's already diminished up there at the top, and they just flood the market with all of these orders that they don't really, they don't need to make money on because they've already made all their money. They can lose on this because they've already made their money during the distribution, all right? So this is, this is market structure. This is what is being created by the big boys, by the smart money, by the people who get all of these advantages from the exchanges. They get these advantages from the exchanges so they provide liquidity so that you and I have something to do during the day, right? They need liquidity in the markets. These big boys provide that liquidity. And for the for providing that the markets give them certain certain um, um, uh, permissions, right? Advantages. But if you know where to look, we've got some great potential for trade setup. Now you've seen some of the market structure and understand better how it develops. How are you going to use it? Okay. You, do you need to be watching market structure every day to better understand what might happen next? I mean, do you need to become a student of market structure? Or do you just need some tools to help you understand what's happening and what's likely to happen next? And so that's what we're all about, tools. And and I, I, I mentioned this on Thursday. I was a contractor previous to being a trader. And if there was a tool that made a job easier, better, more efficient, I'm, that's all about, I'm all about it. Now, you can sit and learn to read market structure, and I've been doing it for so long, I can without even opening my eyes hardly. I, I can pretty much see it and read it and understand it. But it takes a long time. So we've created tools to help people take advantage of it. Now, I went through this whole explanation so that you can see what's going on. But it's a skill. But you can do it with some tools so that you can see the accumulation and distribution, the markup, and be ready for those up thrust or blowback bars because that's when we enter the trade. Okay, so now I'm going to show you how we're going to add to the market structure analysis, how we're going to add order flow and volume spread analysis and momentum and exhaustion and divergence. This is so we're going to hang these, we're going to add these things to the structure so that we can better understand what's likely to happen next. So most of us prefer tools to doing this, to helping make things better and more efficient. And this is what our tools look like, okay? So one of the things I want to show you here, I want to backtrack just a little bit. There is something else going on, and these are also big boys that helps every this helps with this manipulation and with these up thrust bars and knowing when to expect something after the up thrust bars 
So there's a group of traders called momentum traders. These are also big boys. These are also guys that have a lot of money. They invest heavily in the uh, infrastructure of, of placing and managing the, the trades. Um, so most of us know the buy low, sell high. You know, we want to buy whatever we buy low. And when we're ready to sell it, we want to sell it high, whether it's a car, whether, you know, whatever. You want to buy it at the best price possible so that when you go to sell it, you might even make some money on it. And that's the way that this works in trading. We want to buy low and sell high. So we've got price down here. It's pretty low, but it's starting to shoot up. And now it's higher than it's been. It's, it's as high as it might go. But momentum traders are not the buy low, sell high. They're like, let's buy it when it's high and then sell it when it's higher. But we're going to have to do it quickly and we're going to have to be stealthy about it. But this is also what happens with, uh, and, and, and it draws in us retail traders, most of us every time is you see this, and what do we call this? We call this a breakout. How many of you have tried trading breakouts? You jump into the breakout, and just as soon as your order gets filled, the breakout is over, and price turns and goes the other way. Oh, what happened? Price was going up. What happened? So that's what's happening is the momentum traders trade very fast. They're in and they're out, and, they, and, and then all the other big boys start dumping the rest of their assets on the market, and price turns and drops. Okay, so how are we going to know when this is happening? This is our speed tick indicator. The speed tick indicator, this is, this is actually a... a could be an entry trigger for one of our trades when certain other criteria has been met. Okay. A speed tick generally suggests that trades are being processed through the exchanges much, much faster than us little guys, us small retail traders could physically trade, right? So if you look at that and you see you know, this that look at the size of these bars and you know, price is kind of chugging, it's up and down, up and down, and then suddenly whammo, price goes way up here. It is highly unlikely that all of us retail traders got on the phone with each other and all of us said, Okay, ready, one, two, three, go, and push the button, right? So something else some single or, or very low number of entities have now started pushing in a bunch of trades really, really fast. All right? Well, they do that for a reason. They, they're manipulating this, right? It's a manipulation, and that's what we're looking for because we know they're doing it for a particular reason, and I just showed you. Now, if we know this and we know that the reason they're doing it is because they want price to change directions and go the other way, that gives us an edge, right? Now, this down here, this was the very first, uh, when I developed the speed tick, this was um, the histogram I used for developing the speed tick. And so what's going on here on the charts is uh, that we've reached a threshold level of speed, okay? Of the speed at which, think of it as a speedometer, the speed at which the trades are coming in, okay? So instead of trying to read this on a histogram, we don't actually trade with this on the charts. All we do is put this. See, notice that uh, this bar has exceeded threshold one and is into threshold two now. And there's, there's the, actually the settings aren't right on this, but um, there's the speed tick for threshold two. There's a three speed tick for threshold two. 
Here's the speed tick for threshold one, okay? So that's where it all came from. This is underlying. I put these on here because it's easier, and this is where our eyes are. This is called our heads-up display indicators. We don't need I, – I wanted to get rid of as much superfluous information as I could on our charts and only keep on our charts what we need for making trade decisions. Well, I didn't need any of this. I didn't need any of this, so I got rid of it. I got rid of all of it and just put it right here where our eyes are, okay? So that's an important piece of information. Exhaustion is also an important piece of information. We look at momentum oscillators. Again, this is what would be very typical on a chart. This would be an oscillator. Maybe this is a RSI oscillator. And people have to put this whole thing on the chart only to know when this little piece of information exists and this little piece of information exists, okay? That tells us when price is overbought or oversold. But what happens when, when price is overbought or oversold? Exhaustion sets in. And we want to know when exhaustion sets in. We want to know when after an upthrust bar what, that's been manipulated for various reasons, it's also pushed beyond where we would expect it to continue because it's been overbought or oversold. So that's what we do. Again, instead of that oscillator, we just put a colored um, outline on the bar. Now you can, and you can color these anything you want. These are user definable inside the uh, indicator, or you could put some sort of a, you know, anything, uh, one of the Ninja Trader symbols or something instead of doing the outline. You can, however you want to do it. All right, so so here's a confluence of two different things right now, overbought and oversold, and the rate at which orders are being processed. All right, now, here we go again. Here's the third thing that we're going to hang on market structure. Remember I said we're watching volume. But we're not watching all volume. We're watching particular types of volume, very specific. We want to know very specific things about the volume that's coming in and how it's coming in. So what we're looking to do is anticipate a weakness in an uptrend or strength in a downtrend. And, and so what we're going to do is we're reading every tick inside the bar. So we've got this bar that starts out, and very early on, the buyers are in control. They, they keep buying, buying, buying until they hit an area up here where the sellers have been kind of sitting and waiting. They're not getting tired. They're not even in the trade yet. They're sitting here waiting for exhaustion to set in. They're waiting for the at these price levels. It could be a support and resistance area or some other price levels that they predetermined that would be a good point to start selling. Well, this is the point where the buyers and sellers start fighting with each other. Well, when one fighter is exhausted and the other is not, which one is likely to win, all things being equal? The exhausted fighter is likely to win. I mean, uh, lose. So that's what happens. So we want to know when this kind of churning is happening. All right? And we put all of that information into one little dot. And that's all the information you need for making a decision based on the other indicators and the, the confluence of conditions uh, of those uh, things that I showed you uh, earlier. You know, we, we have order flow. We have uh, exhaustion. Uh, now we have volume that we're measuring, okay? And we have here... Uh, a byproduct of the speed tick trade. Now, I said think of the speed tick as a speedometer, right? Well, you may be able to go really fast in a car that doesn't have great acceleration, but the car will eventually get to a very fast speed. Ricochet is the same thing, but has sudden acceleration. 
we notice that when prices suddenly accelerate, that's like those HFTs, Leah, and the other big boys. The button got hit. Um, of course, it's all algorithms and it gets triggered automatically. But the button got hit just like hitting the uh, uh, the nitrous oxide button in a, in a race car, you know. Uh, it just, blam, it takes off. Now, it may not ever reach 100 miles an hour, but by golly, it accelerated very fast. So that's why there's a difference between the ricochet and the speed tick. The speed tick is maximum speed. Ricochet is maximum acceleration. And we notice when we have that kind of acceleration, a button got pushed and something's about to change. Okay? These are our support and resistance lines. Very, very powerful lines. And we have our, um, our uh, relative strength numbers at the end. So the end, these numbers here at the end, um, up in here, these tell us how strong we can expect this line to be or how much we can expect price to react to that line if it approaches in a steep fashion like this, okay? If it just drifts into the line, then these numbers aren't going to help us much. If price just climbs like crazy and slams into that line, then these numbers come into effect. All right, and we use those relative strength numbers for our support and resistance. We've got really good lines of actually one of our one of our better sellers on our website are our, our support and resistance lines. We got the pivots and mid pivots. So this is I, I'm I'm always looking for ways to not change what we're doing to make what we're doing better and more efficient. So I, I had all of these other things, you know, the exhaustion and the, the rate of order flow and all that, and everything's working good and we're, we're kicking butt. And then I started thinking, okay, how can this be better? What is the market telling us that I just need to listen for or look for that's going to help me make an even better trade decision? So I started studying divergence. For those of you that don't aren't familiar with divergence, it's very simply um, where price and momentum are going in different directions. So in short, we're reading that price is dropping here, right? It's coming from up here and it's dropping, 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 dropping. But suddenly at this point, momentum is actually increasing. So even though price is dropping, momentum has headed the other way. And the, the, the big takeaway from that is when price and momentum diverge, price will almost always attempt to catch up with momentum and change directions. Almost always happens. That is huge. Okay, so flash was the very first divergence indicator that we developed. And it was like a light bulb went off. And suddenly, we're really killing it. And everything, we're hitting on all cylinders now that we've introduced the divergence into our trading. And it got so good that we created another uh, divergence indicator called McDiver, works just like the flash, but with a different momentum oscillator. And then we thought, let's keep this up. Let's try seven different momentum oscillators and measure divergence of price against seven different momentum oscillators. So the number here will tell us that at this point, at the open of this bar, seven different momentum oscillators has told us that divergence has set in. Over here, two of those momentum oscillators are suggesting that divergence has set in, okay? So that's how the super D works. So not only are we looking for a confluence of styles of trading, one minute, 
not only are we looking at these different different uh, characteristics and styles of trading, but we're doing it also inside the Super D. We're measuring lots of different ways of measuring momentum. Okay, so we've got a confluence of momentum. We've also got the Mometer. Okay, speaking of momentum, this is a different type of momentum. This is where price is pushing hard in one direction. Okay, so you think of momentum. Think of, uh, you know, maybe uh, a ball is at the top of a hill and it starts to roll off that hill. And as it goes and it starts, you know, hitting that, heading down the hill, it starts gaining more and more momentum. Well, at one point, you really didn't know that momentum had set in. You don't know momentum has started until it has already started. And then you can go back and you can go, oh, well, this is where it started. This is what the Mometer does, okay? So you can go and we can start looking at, and this paints these bars, these colors, uh, again, user definable, um, where when it's a dark color, momentum has just started. But as it starts to build, it's the colors start getting a little bit lighter. So it's easy. It's really easy. This helps you make decisions. You can and you can build. You can you can create rules around this and say I'm not trading any trades unless the mo meter has the light gray color or almost white color or whatever, because the the longer the momentum, the the longer it's been going, the more imminent the exhaustion, which is why we. Um, measure momentum. This is why we're interested in momentum. Not in and of itself. We're not looking to jump in when when momentum is taking off because we don't know when it's going to necessarily end just by watching momentum. It could go and go and go. But with a confluence of our other indicators and understanding that we've already got indicators now <coughs> to tell us that we can anticipate weakness is setting in. Okay? So this is a big heads-up indicator to pay attention and start looking for the other indicators. Right? They don't all happen all at once. All of the other indicators help us understand what's going on, helps us see the market structure, helps us understanding what's happening inside that market structure, and helps us see where our advantages are likely to show up so that we're ready that when the advantage does show up, we're ready. We're just click. You know, we pull the trigger. We're, we're ready. No surprises. So the rock star, even though we have all these other indicators, the rock star is the one that pulled it together for so many traders because we've combined. Uh, uh, ask me later, Judith, uh, at the end. I'll ha be happy to answer that. So we've combined some of the best indicators into one to make seeing where your trade entry should be easier. Now, just because you get a rock star on a chart does not mean to take a trade. I had this one guy, <laughs> I swear to God, I couldn't, I couldn't talk any sense into him. He wants to trade every rock star because he thinks it's a signal generator. Rock stars, there's no such thing as, he, he kept saying, uh, what's that term? Um, False signals. False sig There's no false signals. The signal pops up when there is a confluence of events inside the indicator that suggests if you're trading our rules, this would be a good place to take a trade. Okay? Again, the next level, you know, I told you when we introduced the flash, people jump to the next level with their trading. The rock star did that for so many of our traders because it made the decision-making easier and faster. 
So when we get a rock star pop up on a trade, we're excited. We're ready to go. But we're already ready for that rock star to pop up because we've been watching the other indicators and the confluence of the other indicators develop. And we're like, okay, step one's in place. Now, the, oh, now there's step two. That's in place. Oh, there's step three. There's step four. Well, I got a rock star on the open of the next bar. I'm going to short it. And that's pretty much how it works. And until then, we're just sitting at our desk watching, um, kind of like waiting on a bus. There's nothing to do. You just watch. You watch and you see the bus coming down the road. That's your indicator. As you see that bus coming, you go, okay, well, maybe that's my bus. I don't know yet. Can't tell. Just going to sit here and wait and watch. As the bus gets close, you go, yeah, that might be my bus, but i got to wait and see if it pulls up in front and stops and the door opens. And that's the rock star. The door opens. It's my bus. You just get up and get on. That simple. All right. So we're all about keeping the risk down to a minimum. So how do you do that? How do you how do you keep the sharks from attacking? Well, you can't keep them from attacking, but you can certainly expose yourself to them less, right? The less time you're in a market, the less exposed you are. We're all about lowering our exposure. Think about like a piranha, you know, where you the piranhas go in and they take a quick bite and they get out. That's kind of what we do. Now, we're looking for a quick trade. We're, I mean, if we're in a trade two minutes, it feels like a long time. Most of our trades are less than a minute, but we have real high probability of knowing and understanding what's going to happen within that minute. So, we all have, our, not all of us, some of us, uh, if you've been doing this for a while, some people have changed their targets and stops. But generally, we're looking at a five-tick target and a seven-tick stop, and that's managed. Okay? That means if the conditions that got us into the trade change such that we never would have gotten into the trade, under those conditions, then we're going to start shortening our stop, right? So I might get into a trade with a seven tick stop, but I might actually get out at break even or minus one or plus one or whatever. Seven ticks is the worst that we'll do on a trade. Okay. I never manage the target. It pretty much stays solid, but I will manage the trade based on a seven tick uh, or uh, based on the current conditions. So a lot of people that don't understand this, they don't understand this. They still think, no, nope, I got to I gotta trade for 10, 15, 20, 30, 50 ticks a trade, or you can't make any money. And for many years, I kept trying to follow trading gurus and trade rooms and videos and you know, bulletin board posts and all of that stuff. Um, and I was having absolutely no luck because I couldn't manage my emotions, right? If I was supposed to stay in for 50 ticks, my emotions would cause my head to do all kinds of stupid stuff. So not only are you reducing the amount of exposure to the markets when you get in and out in a hurry, you're also reducing the amount of times you're going to shoot yourself in the foot, right? Which was huge to me. Now, can you make any money? Depends on what you're trying to do. Are you trying to make a lot of money or are you trying to become a consistently profitable trader? See, that was my problem for a long time also. I was trying to make a lot of money. I had no idea if I could. I had no idea if I could even be profitable consistently. And when I say profitable, $5 a day, every day, that's consistently profitable. Are you going to make a living at that? No. 
but I had never even proven to myself that I could be a profitable trader. So that's where all of this started. That's where all of this started. Let's prove to myself I can be a profitable trader. If I can be, then that's, let's build on that. All right, so you can see, that, and all of these have the, the, um, the, the um, if you have these winning trades, all of these have the fees uh, taken out. Um, you can make a consistent income doing this and much better than just an income. So let's talk about the actual setups. Okay. So we have the rock star trade setup. This is uh, everybody's favorite. So what we've got here, and I'm going to go through this step by step. Okay. So we're looking for something specific for a rock star trade setup for step one price breaks out of a channel. Remember that accumulation or distribution that price has been channeling and suddenly price breaks out of that channel. All right. It could be up or down. It doesn't matter. They, they, these big boys, they do it in both directions. So then we see that momentum has been established. We're looking at our mo meter and we're going, okay, so there's strength. Now we're, we need to start looking for weakness. So we're starting to look for weakness. That's when we start getting overbought or oversold. We're looking for to telltale signs that the this particular bar is being manipulated. That's our speed tick. Remember, the orders are being processed really fast, much faster than we can do it. We slam into an area of major support and resistance. Price slams into it, might even test the other side, and then it backs up. And, and price opens five ticks below resistance or above support, and we get a rock, gold rock star at the open of that bar. That's where we're going to enter a trade with a bracket order of a five-tick target and a seven-tick stop. And like I said, most times, now, here's a, right here, um, the, um, the order would be for right here at the open of this bar. But if the bar opened and then jumped up here and you got a chance to get filled better, you know, you're shorting it, you want to take your trade up in here. And then you'll be out of the trade before uh, most other people, okay? We're looking for a very quick in and out trade so we don't have a bunch of emotions to manage and we're not allowing the all of the other, um, the other uh, players in the market to come and get us, right? So that's the rock star trade. Now we have one that's called a naked rock star trade. Naked rock stars is a little less conservative because we no longer have support and resistance, but we still have a good trade setup and it's got the same rules, but since we don't have support or resistance, we're going to need more confluence. Okay. More suggestions that price is about to change direction and that, you know, it's going to be either, the bar is overbought, oversold, um, and or has a pullback alert. Preferably both, but for it to qualify for a naked rock star trade, it just needs one or the other. Okay? If you have both, even better. And then at the open of the bar would be your trade. Now, we have this zone on the side of our charts. If, generally speaking, I'm just going to say generally speaking, if this bar open inside this zone, no trade. Even if we get a rock star, no trade. 
Now, to make the decision-making easier on our trade room charts, um, the rock star will print in a different color so that it may be you've kind of zoned out and you don't, you're not looking at this. As soon as this bar open uh, and uh, the rock star prints, it would print on our charts. It's blue, but you can make it any color you want. All right. So we want to make sure, because if it's inside this zone, chances are that, Price isn't going to be as exhausted as we would want it to be. And, and it's a good chance it's kind of still in a channel. Okay. And like I said, we do not need support and resistance behind it. All right. So that's our naked rock star trade setup. Now, this is the actually the first trade setup I was doing many, many years ago, um, right after developing the speed tick. So we still trade this, although the bulk of our trades are rock star and naked rock star trades. This is our speed tick trade. So price breaks out of a channel, just like the rock star. We're getting good, strong uh, push up or down. We get overbought or oversold. We got um, the um, speed tick markets being manipulated. And then we run up and we slam into that resistance. And then price hits the resistance, tests it, and then backs up. And this bar opens under the resistance. Can't be on it. Can't be above it. Got to be under it. And that's where we put on our trade. All right. Again, if it backs up, you can get it here. I wouldn't take it on the line but I would take it here and we're going to short it for five ticks. All right. Uh, I think Keith or somebody uh, already referenced this, but I'm going to show you real quick. Um, these are some results I'm going to show you. And these are results that have been collected from our trade room by one of our traders that has been with us for a, a, a good while. He used to be a, a, in his, previous professional life, a budget analyst for a large corporation, and he's decided to start keeping track of the numbers for us. Uh, I didn't ask him to do this. He just decided he wanted to prove it and prove it to himself, and he's now proving it to everybody else. So he still collects this data. Um, and so these are results taken from our room. I'm going to tell you right now, don't expect to get these results. Um uh, Unless you practice, 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 you've been doing this for a while. This isn't the kind of thing where you just start and start copying what we're doing. Um, it takes time. Um, these indicators aren't going to do things for you. They only help you make decisions. Uh, and then don't trade with real money. You know, only trade with money that you can afford to lose. This is for an educational purpose only. Okay, so I do all that so that I can show you this. These are the results. They're on our website, uh, and I and we put the uh, Keith put the uh, um, link. Up there. Sorry, but here's the link. If you. Uh, looking at this on the video. So, I mean, this is just the data as it was collected and we aggregated it and, and uh, you know, ended up over from 2020 to 2023. This is our winning percentage. Okay. So if you traded uh, a single contract for all those trades, we're looking at, let's look at this first. So we're looking at uh, a little over 6,000 trades, which which nets out to, and I think somebody asked this on uh, Thursday and I forgot to answer, but about six trades, you know, you look at all this stuff uh, that I've been showing you and you go, well, yeah, but how often does that happen? It happens a lot. Um, on average, about six trades per session. Used to be five, now it's six. So it's getting even better. All right. So you can do the math. You can do the numbers. All right. Now, so here's a piece of information for you to look at to decide if this is right for you. 
you may need some more stuff. So we've got a, a, a an updated, a newly updated videos page. You can get to it right from our main page on our website. And you just go right to our video uh, page and you can, uh, oh, I didn't give you that link there, Keith. Can you get that off of there and put it in? Sorry. I snuck that one in on you. That's a new one. By the way, Keith doesn't work for me. He's just awesomely helpful guy. <laughs> so we want you to be well informed. It's it's. I love it when people come uh, uh, and say, I'm ready to get started. I've been watching your videos all week, and we're ready to get started with you. I want people to be very well informed. Now, you can only imagine that after doing this for 15 years, we might have a couple of videos. Well, there's a few hundred videos that you can watch. And uh, the interesting thing you may find is that the videos that you can find on YouTube or, or on our channel from 10 years ago, they're the same. The trading is the same. We may have introduced a, another couple of indicators or whatnot, but the trading hasn't changed in all those years because it works. We don't need to change it. We have, okay, so here's a funny thing, right? We have, uh, uh, I just sent out all these emails for this event and you guys got the emails and other people that have uh, purchased our products over the, in the past, maybe they drifted away from trading. They had other things going on. They wanted to try some other system or whatever. People, you know, everybody does different things for different reasons. I sent out that email and I swear I had about 15 people go, Hey, you know, I used to trade with you guys and then for whatever reason I had to go away from trading and whatever, and I need to get set up again. I need to, uh, to learn, you know, get back into it and all that stuff. A bunch, a bunch this particular time. Maybe it's the new year or something. I don't know. But, um, so they're all coming back, but they all are saying, okay, well, what's changed and what do I need to know? And I'm like, nah, you, you know it. Once you start again, it's going to take you about a day to start remembering what we do. It's really the same thing. Once you know it, then it's something you just need to practice and stay and keep your skill levels up. Okay. So video training, we've got tons of videos. All right. Um, this video, this you can find on our website on that page. If you'll notice, the one on the left here is already the one from Thursday. So you can go right to that. And you can see as many videos as you want and learn about what we do and how we do it. All right? And you can look at those. The ones I like for people to look at are the trade of the day videos. Again, hundreds of those that we put on, uh, on our site here. And just watch. They're only a couple minutes long. Just watch, watch the trades, watch the trade setups, watch what we do here. It's live from the trade room. Okay. This isn't me commenting on the afterwards. <laughs> Our traders in the trade room would bust me for that. This is actually live from the trade room. My commentary during the trade room in the trade. Uh, yeah, some people have, and some people do it, Wayne. That's absolutely something you could do. So watch the trade of the day videos and you'll start seeing the same thing over and over and over again. If you want to know deeper into, uh, you know, about what we do and how we do it and why we do it and all of that, we've got our introductory series uh, on our uh, videos page. Okay. Everything I taught you today is in there and a whole bunch more. Okay. So we're going to offer you guys a, a, a nice little discount for any one of our packages. Go to our, uh, our store. And now we've just recently um, reintroduced because PayPal has allowed us. They actually called me on the phone. Nobody calls me. They called me and said, we want you to start offering these, this program 
So they helped me get it all set up. And you can now do the pay later program. And you can either pay it in four different payments or you can just break it up into monthly installments, however you want to do it to help you get started with us. Now, for those of you, and I and I do recognize some of you here that ha, uh, are previous buyers of, of indicators and such in the past, um, if you want to upgrade to one of these packages, uh, 100% of what you paid in the past goes towards the upgrade. Okay. And we haven't raised prices on any of these packages in many years. 